recognition for this, for also using cost-effective ways of, of organizing elections. True. Uh, so let's go straight to this. Um, Dr. Euster, um, I'm asking you this question because you are part of the, you know, um, the, the constitutional review team. Um, what does the Senate stand for? You know, if you look at what they do and what the parliament does, just so much close, and there's probably not a big difference if you're there uh, to see. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. I think I should start with a correction. Yeah. The Senate is also part of the parliament. Mm -hmm. So the Rwandan legislature or parliament is composed of two uh, of two chambers and the first chamber is the chamber of deputies uh, and the second chamber is the senate mm -hmm. um, in parliamentary uh, organizations across the world there are several modes of having a parliament you can have one parliament that is uh, one chamber but you can also have uh, a, ch a lower chamber in, in some places they call it we don't call it a lower chamber, we call it a chamber of deputies, mm -hmm. and you have a senate. And um, it's a political choice. So I should say that Rwanda made the political, political choice, choice yeah. uh, to have the senate. Uh, the difference with uh, what Rwanda does and some other countries, that system also exists, is that um, the electoral college is not entirely the same with the, with the parliament. The parliament, I mean with the, with the chamber of deputies, yeah. the chamber of deputies uh, is elected um, by the general uh, population and the senators have uh, college elections, they have appointment positions and when you look at it for Rwanda actually it's an opportunity for inclusion as mm -hmm. well. So I should say that there was a political choice uh, to have a parliament uh, that is composed of two um, chambers, uh, the Chamber of Deputies and the Senators. And I think uh, the greater discussion with the Senate is what it does. In, in the Rwandan Senate uh, is in charge of the uh, fundamental principles of the country, monitoring their implementation and ensuring that uh, the government is uh, fairly and faithfully implementing mm -hmm. and anybody else is in, that is involved and it's also in charge of monitoring Article 57 or 56 and 57 of the Constitution. And when you look at those three articles, actually, Article 10, Article 56, and Article 57 of the Constitution, they really all relate to the foundations of what this country is. The foundations of unity, the foundations of um, fighting against genocide, mm -hmm. uh, the foundations of accountability. So those foundations mm -hmm. that, um, uh, that we have secured as a country, the Senate on a day-to-day -day basis uh, ensures that um, there is compliance to them. You know, uh, we'll probably go into the Articles 56 and 57 and 58, but um, help me understand, if they're in charge of monitoring um, the fundamental principles and of course fighting genocide ideology and ensuring unity and reconciliation, how do they work closely with uh, you know, all these you know, institutions that were set in place uh, the National uh, Unit and Reconciliation Commission, there's Forum for Political Parties, there's Synergy. How do they work together? You should also say that it's RGP. Oh, because yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> part, of, part of those fundamental yeah. uh, principles is also the governance, uh, the, the whole apparatus of governance mm. and the role of the Senate. I think it's, um, the Senate is also a legislator in other, way, in, mm. in other ways. But I will just give an example of how they work with the Rwanda Governance Board uh, along the lines of Article 57 and Article 56. Mm -hmm. And they do the same with different, uh, different institutions. We register political, po political organizations. And the Senate is in charge of monitoring whether the political organizations are actually uh, abiding to the principles that are, uh, that are in Article 57 and 56. And in case they find that there is uh, an abuse or something that requires punishment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the violation of those articles, the Senate is going to request uh, the Rwanda Governance Board and that sometimes I think the Office of the Ombudsman to come in. So I should say that um, the multiplicity of institutions at different levels, because you should remember that these institutions 
Some of them are purely public institutions and others are part of the executive, mm -hmm. but the Senate is part of the legislature directly. And therefore, they, they do that, uh, that bigger mandate of the, of the parliament, which is um, holding government accountable and, uh, and bringing those, the, the, the voice of the, of the parliament mm -hmm. into these particular principles. So why do we have them? How do they work with one another? I think really it's the general question you could ask for everyone else. How do you work with one another? Because the law establishes clearly their mandate vis-a-vis uh, -vis these principles. They directly engage with the population on those principles. They engage with the parties, with the, with, with the, with the institutions that are in charge of implementing. And they kind of bring out an, uh, advisors to the government, but also areas of concern where, uh, where these principles might be at stake. Mm -hmm. uh Men, uh, there are some of the questions. We had a discussion earlier uh, this week with uh, Gatete talking about this whole thing. Uh, do you think, you know, looking at having the lower chamber, the chamber of deputies and the Senate here, uh, she was talking about the inclusion, probably she will tell us if the, it's, the inclusion means uh, including the senior citizens of the country. Uh, but do you think it is necessary to have... Uh, to have this, a Senate? Yes. Perhaps to, to just bring this into perspective, mm. the Senate, why do we have a Senate now? We didn't have it before. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's actually a good question. Uh, so the Senate, see, many countries adhere to, to principles, mm. including, I'll give you an example of a principle of gender equality. You can say we, 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 we espouse the idea of having gender equality in the country, but that's a principle. You need mechanisms. Many countries agree to most of the good principles, democracy, unity, and so on. But you have to have mechanisms. There have to be political will to implement, to enforce those principles. Now, the Senate, the Senate, the Senate oversees and checks if these principles, there are mechanisms in place, and if these mechanisms are working perfectly. Now, is the Senate fulfilling its mandate? We're going to elect new senators. Mm. Do we have, is, is, has our senators been effective so that we are confident and enthusiastic to elect new senators and give them two terms so two things mm. number one i would like to challenge the media we don't hold us our, our parliamentarians in general accountable i haven't seen many articles that talks about parliamentarians and their uh, and their performance and for the, that question is perhaps good. this is noted and perhaps yeah. it's something you should do yeah. number two i have seen the head of state repeatedly complaining that the parliament is not assisting him. What he means is, you do not advise me on, the, on this government. It is your job to check. There are three things. So we have the ten principles that we talked about. Mm. But we have national goals. You know them. Everyone knows them. It's being staying together, being accountable, and thinking big. Yeah. Those are, and the constitution says, that the Senate, that we, Rwandan should have a common vision of their destiny. That means it is the mandate and article which you talked about, 56, talks about w the powers that the Senate has. So the Senate, the powers of the Senate stand, stands from the Constitution. They are not imposing themselves. They have all the powers. However, do they ensure accountability of this country? We have the national strategy, uh, NST, National Strategy for Transformation. We have a uh, seven-year government program. We have Agenda 5063 of the African mm. Union. We have just signed this continental free trade area. Does the Senate see itself in those goals? So I believe, I have not, I've, I was discussing with someone, government officials, and, and, and uh, I'm glad RGB is here, government officials, they sign performance contracts annual performance objectives mm. that they have to fulfill. I realize parliamentarians do not sign these types of... of they probably they, have internal arrangements. They, they, they sign, the staff yeah. of parliament sign these because they are public uh, government, yeah. government staff. But the parliamentarians today say, we're going to transform, we're going to eradicate genocide ideology by doing this and this and this this year. We're going to ensure that agriculture uh, has advanced, or that Rwanda has positioned this, and so on. So, but that's, that's on the thinking big, mm. but on the accountability. 
Do we have a Senate that is reticent so because it does not want to create problems with uh, members of the executive? Are they proactive? Are they, do we need the middle maybe? Because, like I said, the only one of the indicators that I have is that the president has repeatedly complained that members of parliament have not supported him adequately, which means they ought to come to us and tell us this new Senate that is coming is going to play its role more centrally, more effectively. And for that, which is why I'm encouraging the media again to start holding <coughs> our parliamentarians accountable That's to how they are fulfilling the national goals that we have. Mr. Charles, I don't know if this is under your mandate to tell us what probably, you know, uh, from his comments, uh, what we should be looking forward into a senator, what what senators should actually do to make sure that, you know, the, that part of, you know, creating checks and balances, the oversight is, is actually there for, the, you know, the president to feel is, is fine with the, with, the, with the legislative assembly. Well, uh, I think... Uh, my view is that the Senate, just like the, the lower chamber of parliament, yeah. has been doing its work. And uh, as somebody who has also been following up these the activities yeah. and you know, educating the population on the mandate and the, the, what the senators are supposed to be doing, I've been following up the activities on the field. I've seen that they have been going around trying to see if these principles are followed to the latter. So I think uh, I wouldn't say that uh, there's a very big gap on what the senator should be doing in terms of you know, following up on the principles as contained in Article 10 of the Constitution, mm -hmm. but also following up on the, the mandate and the responsibilities and the, the, of these political parties or organizations that we have. So I wouldn't want to dwell into that, but from what we hear from the population, mm -hmm. because we also get feedback from the population, from the voters, mm -hmm. We think and we've heard that they are satisfied with what the, 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 the parliament has been doing, sure. especially the, the chamber of uh, uh, the, the Senate. Uh, going forward, uh, I think the people of Rwanda, especially the, the electoral college that's going to be participating in these elections, are eager to, to again to, to move forward because yeah. this is a process. As, as Gatete was saying, this Senate was established in 2003. And this is the second round of elections that we're going to have for these senators. It's, long, it's not a long period of time. Yeah. So I think it's also a learning process. And as we move, as we move forward, I think uh, uh, the Senate is going to be seen more and more active in implementing its mandate as contained in the, in the Constitution. One of the, uh, if if I may, um, mm. I have, for example, the, the, the gender equality mm. and particularly the 30% requirement. Is that the increasing uh, part you're uh, talking about? I, I should mention, mm -hmm. you know, part of the Senate's mandate mm. is to approve um, members of the, uh, of the commissions, uh, commissioners, the chairs, and sometimes some political appointments. But I, yeah. my experience is with the commission. At one time, the Law Reform Commission um, had seven law reform, uh, law reform commissioners are appointed. Mm -hmm. the, commissioners went, um, the commissioners went to the, to the Senate for, for hearing, and it was realized that by the proposed commissioners, 28, it required 20, the number of women on the team made it 28.5, not 30 percent. And the Senate had to request government to add, to remove one man and add a man uh, and add a woman, mm. in order to ensure that the 30 percent uh, is fulfilled. Now, it should be understood from these governance principles. Sometimes it's not even necessarily the intention of to not make it 30 yeah. percent, but the checks and balances actually mm. work at that. So, I wanted to bring that as an example of how the Senate has been at the centre of verifying whether the respect of these uh, fundamental principles actually are being, uh, are being co complied to by all, the op all, all those that are making decisions in this regard. Mm. You know, it's very, a very uh, difficult question to respond to, uh, have they done their job when we don't have them here? And one of the reasons I probably didn't invite them was mm. um, we don't know if any of them is eligible to run again.
So I didn't want to compromise their, <laughs> their eligibility <laughs> and everything. So uh, you're going to help us. Who is yeah. eligible to run? In, in the, these guys, um, the senators currently serving, are they eligible to run again? Um, uh, are we going to see new faces all over? Maybe let me first remind uh, our viewers what, what are the requirements for one to stand as yeah. the Senate. One, you have to be at one this. Two, one is by nationality. Yeah. Two, you've got to be at least 40 years of age. Three, you should be at one list of integrity and not have been charged and uh, uh, punished in, in the court of law for mm. uh, an imprisonment period of six months or more than that. Yeah. And uh, of course, you should be holding at least a bachelor's degree and some other things. So on the question of whether the sitting members of parliament do qualify to stand, as long as they do fulfill what, have been, what has been said, they can stand. But let me say that uh, the current Senate mm. was sworn in on 10th of October 2011 for an eight-year term of oh, office. Yeah. Meaning, as we start receiving candidatures, by the way, we started on 22nd of July, yeah. and it's supposed to be ending on, 9th, uh, on no. 9th of August. Yeah. Meaning, by the time we are receiving these candidatures, the, the current Senate is still in the office because it's supposed to be ending around the 9th of August, uh, 9th of October, mm. 2019. So. The, the, the issue of whether they do qualify is not, is not a big issue here. And as far as, by the way, the Electoral Commission is concerned, uh, according to the law for us, we, we do receive each and everyone that submits his or her candidature. And our duty is just to compile some kind of a report to the Supreme Court. And we are not allowed to reject any of the candidatures that come our way. Okay. So we just submitted them to the Supreme Court, and it's the sup Supreme Court that the approves all these candidates. And the Supreme Court brings back to us the files of those uh, candidates that have been approved and those that have not been approved. And our duty is just to announce those that have been approved. So I'm saying, what I'm trying to say, I'm just reminding people of the term of office of the senators that we have, which is supposed to be expiring around the 9th of October, meaning if they can submit their candidatures at the time they are also still in the, in, in, in the Senate, yeah. that's an issue that can be debated. But as far as we are concerned, we shall be receiving all the candidatures that we shall come our way, and our duty shall be to submit this candidature to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court being the one responsible to interpret all these laws will be the one to, to decide whether if somebody has submitted the candidature, whether at the same time is still in the Senate to do qualify or has not qualified. Why is the law silent on this part, the Constitution? It's quite silent. It's not, it's not directly saying, yes, you're eligible or no, you're not. Um, you could probably tell us. Well, I think it's not silent, actually. Yeah. First of all, the conditions of eligibility are very clear. So the Supreme Court is not going to set conditions of eligibility. Mm. But uh, assessing the candidature, just like, uh, and I think it's the, it's the, it's the complementarity of organization, I mean of, of organs, or, or, of organs yeah. that mm. is at play at this stage, mm. because consider the, uh, the, the elections of the Chamber of Deputies. That whole process is entirely done by the Electoral Commission. And of course, it goes back and the general public does elections. And when you look at the election process of the Senate, it's college elections. It doesn't mean those who elect them are representatives of, of people at different levels, yeah. especially at the local government level. So the opportunity that the, that the Senate, I mean that the Supreme Court also looks at, uh, at, the, at the candidates to assess whether, the, the, whether they qualify as per the law, because it's very clear as per the law. Mm. It's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not just uh, an appreciation of the court. The court is going to appreciate on the basis of what the law says. So it's, uh, instead of looking at it as, as a form of silence, 
I see it as an opportunity of the complementarity of organs in the process of making uh, or of appointing people. You would have asked the same. Why is it that when cabinet appoints, uh, appoints heads of institutions mm -hmm. and ambassadors, why do they go through Senate for confirmation mm -hmm. hearing? I should assume that uh, that, kind, that character of complementarity yeah. is at play also in this particular approach and method. Fantastic. <coughs> by, by the way, yeah. I, I, I want to compliment on what uh, Dr. Usa was saying. The, the law is not silent. The Constitution is very clear on the term of office, as I was saying. Mm -hmm. when, you look, when you read Article 63, it's very clear on the term of office, when it starts and when it ends. It says that the term of office of any elected person, including the senators, mm. ends on the date they were sworn in. And that's why I was saying, those that are still in the Senate right now, those that were elected. By the way, uh, looking at the composition of our Senate, this year it is only going to be only 20 members of the Senate that, whose time is going to be expiring. And the rest will be continuing until next year because they do join the Senate at different times. Mm. But what I was saying, Article 63 of the Constitution is very clear on that. Again, when you read Article 132, it's very clear that the, the Senate cannot be dissolved, meaning there, there, we can't have any period in time when we would not have a Senate. Unlike the lower chamber of deputies, mm. where the law says that for electoral purposes, the Chamber of the Deputies is dissolved. Therefore, if the Chamber of Deputies cannot, I mean the Chamber of Senators cannot be dissolved, there is that continuity purpose in the law. And I wanted to stress that the law is not very silent on that. Mm -hmm. Because it defines on the term of office, it also says that the Senate cannot be dissolved. And if it cannot be dissolved, then we cannot have a vacuum between the time we are receiving candidatures and the time we are going to have another Senate. Meaning, those that are still there still have some job to do until when they finish their term of office. I don't know if Katete is, is, is you know, satisfied with the explanations or <laughs> everyone watching. So, and for that reason, let's take a very short break. When we come back, we'll probably be reading some of your comments and your opinion on Twitter, and then we'll go straight into other questions. Are you satisfied with the explanations? Do you think everyone is eligible or not? Do you want to stand? You're going to tell us. Let's go for a short break. Zimanorujem, Ibyo byose biterwa n'agaciro hibyurya n'imyitozo ngorora mu birukora. Inzira ni yirera ikiganiro cyacu kidufasha gusobanukirwa indwara zitandukanye ndetse no kuzirinda. Abaganga batandukanye bizobere tuzaba bagereraho badusangiza ubunararibonye bafite. Inguara zose mu gasobanukirwa uruni rwo rubuga inama zitandukanye ku mirire n'imyifatire n'intego y'ikiganiro Buri gihe imeriza horari ya yindi Menya wirinde Welcome back. We're still talking about senatorial elections uh, here on the In Focus, and of course, um, it's Santa Shavia, as always, and it's going to remain like that, hopefully. Now, uh, here are some of the comments. Uh, let me start with this one, Dakaza. 
Dakaza says, what is, what is a parliament and MPs for? What, does, what, what purpose does a parliament and the individuals, apart from the money and the generous benefits packages, they draw and serve in society in ordinary life? I'm genuinely ignorant, and so I beg you to mm -hmm. not make any assumptions about me and my questions. Dakaza over there. Um, I hope it's genuine. Um, I can smell the way the conversation will be charming. Thank you so much. Oh, people appreciate you, Katete, for being part of this. Um, now, there's, there's need to clear the air and not leave people in limbo. <laughs> Will the current senators be eligible in the upcoming sanitary elections? And if yes, well, or no, why? I think this is one of the questions. Um, people are still concerned about the eligibility and all that stuff. But um, uh, let me also take you into this. Are part-time lecturers going to, to be eligible to, uh, to stand, or former lecturers for that matter, to stand for these coming elections in the Senate? Uh, the law says uh, that it is only permanent permanent uh, academic and research staff that are eligible to stand yeah. for, for these elections. So the issue of part-timing is not contained in the law, it's not provided in the law. Uh, but uh, going by the current amendments, yeah. I think you are aware that uh, the, 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 the organic law governing elections has been, uh, has been amended. It's mm -hmm. the process of being amended. In fact, the, the lower chamber and the Senate has already yeah approved the provisions from, from government, mm. proposals from government. It has been provided that uh, uh, for these coming elections, those that are going to be elected, well, I think we're aware that they are going to be elected for a five-year renewable term. So the law has been amended to the effect that those that will be elected, elected for five years and want to come back for a second year consecutive learning term, will not be required to provide that uh, certificate from, their, from the universities or yeah. higher institutions of learning indicating that they are permanently teaching in those universities, unlike as it used to be before the amendment of this law. So in a brief, uh, permanent lecturers or researchers will not be eligible to, to stand, but those that will have stood and elected for a five-year term will be eligible to stand again if they wish and will not be required to provide that certification that they are permanently based or teaching those universities because it's clear they will be members of the Senate okay. and therefore they cannot be teachers and the members of the Senate at the same time. Mm. This is quite an interesting part, um, the eligibility being 40, yet, you know, about over 60% of our population is, you know, the youth. Mm. Uh, isn't that quite, uh, is that inclusiveness? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the senators are advisors yeah. of the government. Um, it's actually quite interesting, and perhaps my colleagues will, will explain it more. Mm. We have, an, now we have a council of elders. Mm. Another indicator that, in my opinion, perhaps we felt the need to add another council of elders, but normally that's what the senators should do. Yeah. That we have a new council is perhaps an indicator that they needed to be reinforced. But the idea of, of senators are people with extensive, vast experience whose job is to advise the government. Remember, they are not, unlike deputies, they are not elected by the Population. They are elected by interest groups, women, associations, the academia, civil society, and some are appointed by the president. But so we don't have the youth part. No, but the mm. youth, that's mm. the point. The youth is elected by the youth in the chamber of deputies yeah. to advance laws, to advance laws that will, to, to, to sponsor laws that would guarantee the interests of the youth, even though when once you get to parliament, you represent the old one and you yeah. don't necessarily represent your constituency. But senators are supposed to be people of that caliber, that level of experience. I can never stand for elections as a senator. As a I'm not senator. even eligible because I do not have, it's assumed that because I'm not 40, I'm not, I don't have the appropriate experience to be an advisor of the country. Because that's what senators do really, mm. is to advise us, are we on the right track? Um, I was discussing with someone, you know, we used to have a government here where 
most of the development would happen in the region of the official who's in yeah. who's in the yeah, portfolio. In the, yeah. So if it's the minister of infrastructure, Mr. Gatete is from uh, I don't know where he's from. It's probably let's say he's from the east. All the infrastructure is going to the east until there's a new one and so on. The, we have a Senate that would normally advise against that. Uh, if we say we want to be a country of unity and reconciliation, but we have government officials who are campaigning and doing politics on be ethnic basis and so on. The Senate, it has happened. The Senate summoned uh, a man who was trying to register a political party called, uh, uh, it, what was his name? He uh, was P.S. Imberakuri. Yes. Now, now it's, it's, an, it's another lady, Mukabunani, who's now in parliament. But there was a man before, before her who was using ethnic language, and he was summoned by Senate to ask him, because the Senate is, to some extent, the custodian of the principles of the Constitution, those principles. And so its job, they have to have a certain level of experience to advise. Now, like you said, the majority of the population are youth. Now, if you look into our parliament and into our cabinet, they are both youthful institutions, because that's where the, their job is not to advise, their job is to implement. They are technicians. Now, the, the senators, and let's say their parents who advise on how things are supposed to be going. That's the rationale of having a Senate of people who are above 40 years old. But I think I, I'm yet to see the inclusiveness there. You know, you're, in, well, you're discriminating the, the biggest population well, uh, of the country. I think the mm. principle of inclusiveness in this country is not a one area. For example, the academic... Uh, private and public yeah. uh, representatives at Senate mm -hmm. are not necessarily represented at, at the deputy level. Yet the youth and women have very specific places in, in the Chamber of Deputies. And people with disability. And, and people with disability. Now, when you look at the general principle on appointing and electing to the, uh, to the Senate and to other organs, the principle of equality is the guiding principle. That does mean, you are aware that at a national level, from the grassroots level up to the, to the parliament, uh, the youth are having specific representation. If you go to the councils of the district, there is a very specific electoral uh, space that is reserved for the youth. So when you just want to look it at the level of 26 members, I should remind you when the remember there are those 12 that get up get elected yeah. and the two that get elected from the academics mm. the eight people that are appointed by the president they wait until the elected ones have been elected and the philosophy that is there is that when the appointing authority is going to appoint he considers those categories of population of the population mm. that have been left out in the process because the whole concept is around bringing on the table some people that haven't been brought. So mm -hmm. the youth have a whole apparatus of representation that is not necessarily in the Senate. Uh, he spoke about the Elders Council. Of course, uh, all the experience that comes, the Senate is also a legislator. So, and, and monitors these specific uh, principles. The Elders Council is an advisory uh, forum and, and council, but you should know that not everyone with a rich experience in this country will make it to the Senate. Some actually will have, been, will have chosen to retire. Mm. The Elders Council requires a minimum age of 50 years. So it allows the space for those who would have wished to, who, who have retired actually, mm -hmm. or who still have gone at the apex of their career, but can provide advisory uh, services in different areas. So I still look at it from the governance principle of inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. The Senate is going to have 26 people uh, that have considered those areas of representation that necessarily the Chamber of Deputies did yeah. not. One other thing you should remember, the Senate is not uh, the, the sitting on the Senate is, is non political, uh, is non -political, uh, political organization affiliated. 
Remember when, you are, when we are voting uh, at the Chamber of Deputies level, we vote actually either yes. political parties candidates, yeah. or we vote lists from political parties. Yeah. I think um, the, the NEC will say it better. <coughs> but the Senate is not political party affiliated elections. So those, uh, those differences allow the opportunity to be inclusive. The absence of the youth, yeah. and it's very hard to say they are absent, because when you look at the average I, age I of mean, the, if, if you look at the average age of the Chamber of Deputies, it's 39 now. The, the current Chamber of Deputies, the average age is 39. And, uh, and therefore you should consider that if the average age is 39, the youth are actually beyond the two representatives of the youth mm -hmm. at that specific level. Uh, that's how we have designed our constitution as a country. Uh, we consider representation at, at all levels. And therefore, I should ask, and, and, and 40 is not a very old age, actually. Well, only, that we are, <laughs> only that we <laughs> are a very young uh, and, uh, nation. Only that yeah. we are a very young nation, yeah. but uh, 40 is not a very old age either. Interesting. So um, I understand the Senate wasn't there before the genocide. And then it came, it, it was, you know, uh, instituted after the genocide as, as probably the choice uh, of, of the government. Uh, why so? I don't know if I should ask you. <laughs> you know, okay. it's, it's quite... Uh, well, let, let me first uh, say that, you know, the issue that you are raising about the youth. Let me uh, also remind people that uh, when you look at the Electoral College, the, the people that are going to be electing the senators, it's, it's the district council, councillors, district councils, and then sector bureau councils. When you look at the composition of these, of these councils, as she was saying, you will find youth representation. Meaning, much as the youth may not stand as senators, they are going to be very, very central in terms of determining who becomes a senator or not. Mm -hmm. Meaning, by extension, the youth are there because they are the ones that are going to decide the next Senate. So I just wanted to say that representation does not only come in the form of sitting in the Senate, mm -hmm. but also comes in the form of who determines who goes there. And the youth are very, very representative for the district councils and the sectors, which are the ones that are going to be electing the, the Senate. Now coming to the, on, on why, and why the country had to wait for, for, tw for 2003 mm. to have the Senate in its history, maybe my colleagues will compliment on that. But it's just as, after the 1994 genocide, very many things changed in this country. And, and uh, it goes with how Rwandans decided to change the course of their governance. Not only the Senate. Mm. Uh, to talk about the Electoral Commission, for which I work for, this country never had such an institution. Elections used to be managed by a government department, a minister of, uh, I think, internal affairs. So you would ask why we had an Electoral Commission in 2000. Mm. You would ask why we, ha we have the, the Rwanda Governance Board. These are institutions that came in place to make sure that the aspirations of Rwandans, as they thought, in changing the course of how they are governed, uh, it, it, it was just changing in, in, mm. in the course of how people decided to govern themselves. And I think the Senate is one of those institutions that came up to, to change and map out a way that people thought they should be governed as one is the current, the current era mm. to address some of the past errors, past, some of the past mistakes that mm -hmm. we encountered mm -hmm. in the ministry. And just to compliment there, mm. so we had a genocide. We had courts of law, we had the parliament, we had government, we had laws that said every Rwandan have, has every right, that said this and that. But in practice, in reality, a section of Rwandan people were being systematically discriminated against. Even though the letter of the law said all Rwandans are equal in rights and so on, in practice, there were mention of ethnic uh, origins on identity cards to be able to use this to discriminate. There was the famous Iringaniza of 
of balancing how many people go to university, how many people go, and so on and so forth. So the law is aspirational. The practice is discriminatory. Now, people sat and said, how have we gotten here? Yet the law seemed to be aspirational, but we got to this. Then people said, let's set a set of principles. Constant quest for solutions through dialogue and consensus. My favorite fund fundamental principle. Yeah. Unity and reconciliation. Fighting genocide ideology. Fighting discrimination of region, of ethnic city, of, 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 of everything. Now, these are principles. But if you do not put a body that is going to advise that, by the way, we're on the right track in achieving, we haven't achieved 100% unity and reconciliation. But we're going towards that. Who is going to advise us? We have a, a, a National Unity and Reconciliation Commission whose job is to actually implement this provision. But who's going to tell us, by the way, Rwandans, be careful, you are not in the right direction. We needed a body that is going to ensure that things that we write, what is a constitution? A constitution, there, there are two, it's a charter and a covenant. A covenant means an agreement between the people. We, the people of Rwanda, agree that we'll do A, B, C, D. Now, this, it's also a charter in the sense that it says, this is how we're going to do it. This is where we're going to pass. Now, once you have agreed to do something, unfortunately, many places, including even here, people agree to do that because they want to have a good paper. But in practice, they, they leave it at the, at the table and then they go and practice something else. The Senate, why it was created, is to say, we have agreed upon very ambitious and laborious principles yeah. that are going to actually lead us in a different direction completely from the one that we've been going on since independence. Yeah. Now, if we have agreed on these things, who is going to advise us and to tell us you must, you are not fulfilling what you have said you will do, you are not doing it. Hence the idea of the Senate. May, perhaps responding to the question why they are even 40 years and above, because they have to have some level of maturity that is special level of maturity that they are sages who, is, who, are, who actually have powers because like, like uh, Usta said, elders can, elders can give advice, it can be taken or not, or not considered. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the advice is it's optional, you can, the government is free to consider or not, but the Senate has constitutional mandate. When they say something, that thing is done. Therefore, if we had an elders council, which is going to advise government on these principles, government, if you have a government that is not keen on unity, the elders will advise, they will say, yes, we heard you, but they will not implement this. But the Senate, if the Senate advises, summons members uh, of the executive and tells them you are erring here, mm. you're going wrong here, please rectify this because the for principles of the Constitution, the things that Rwandans agreed are these. They have that power, constitutional power to do so. So that's why we have a constitution now. Because a country of principles must have a body that oversees how these principles are being met. If, if I may add, <coughs> uh, Gatete earlier mentioned the, the, the strategic choices that this country has taken. Mm. And one of them is accountability. So having chosen to hold ourselves accountable as a nation, uh, accountability can only be a word, except if you have strong institutions that ensure that that kind of accountability that you're committing to mm. is happening. So um, in the whole process of finding our future as a country and, and shaping the kind of direction that we want to move to as a country, there has been a very clear choice of uh, what will take us there. And strong institutions is part of that, uh, of that process and journey. So the Senate should be seen as one of those institutions that enhances its own, its own institutional capacity, but also enhances the strength of the other institutions by kind of holding them accountable through monitoring this specific, uh, through monitoring this specific uh, mandate that it has. 
but also through, of course, uh, f being part of the whole process that creates uh, specific laws yeah. that are very foundational and fundamental to this country. Mm. Talking about accountability, uh, of course, a senator is used to have one term <coughs> in office, non-renewable, and now they have two terms, and you know, one would think they might behave in, in a certain way to, to win the next term. Uh, doesn't this undermine the checks and balances, the accountability that you know, you're talking about? Well, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, members of parliament have terms as well, yeah. only that their term is open. Open-ended. Open-ended. Uh, mayors of districts have yeah. terms. Uh, they have a very specific term that is renewable yeah. once. Um, if you look at many of these elected and some of the appointed positions, mm. having a term period, a, a term limit is common practice. I find it quite uh, demeaning to assume that because I don't have aspirations of, the, of continuity, then I become objective. Consider the age that we already mentioned. Mm. At the age of 40, even serving for eight years at the Senate, when you leave the Senate, you do not become a non-performing one. Yeah. You will continue serving, and we've seen people who have been in the Senate serving in other areas yeah. of the country yeah. that are even very important as well, or equally important. So the whole philosophy that because I have a term, I will not be as objective as I should be is quite a contradiction. So I should mention that uh, having, naturally, <laughs> actually, if you had term <laughs> limits, you should perform better yeah. to yeah. persuade yeah. the electoral college to, that, to uh, that, you the, that you deserve to continue. So it is a contradiction of the whole philosophy of, of, of uh, delivery and being able to give an next mandate because you can deliver actually even better. Interesting. Uh, James, I understand we have less than five minutes, three minutes actually. Um, going forward, what, what should the public know about the upcoming elections as probably your closing remarks? Yeah, um, as, as, as my colleagues were saying, the, the Senate is a very, very important institution. Yeah. Looking at its mandate, looking at its responsibilities, therefore we, we urge Rwandans to understand this and take this seriously. So, and, and, yeah. and for those that shall be participating in these elections as, as voters, we want to urge them to take it seriously as they have always done. This is not the first election that, that we are going to have. Turn up in large numbers, cast their votes, but also vote wisely because this is an important chamber, uh, a house that is very, very fundamental in the life of this and the governance of this country. And as the Electoral Commission, of course, we shall continue mobilizing and sensitizing Rwandans on what is going to be done next. Uh, but at the moment, I want to take this opportunity to, again, to say that we are in the process of receiving uh, people that want to stand as senators. Yeah. We still have about uh, 10 days to go. Uh, we have already started receiving yeah. a number of people vying to stand for the senators. In the do, you have, do you have the, the incumbent? Areas. No, 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 I <laughs> no, 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 it's, 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 it's public, it's public it's, knowledge. It's, uh, it's public. We started on 22nd of uh, July. Mm. Uh, I think today is 27th. We haven't received any. Okay, uh, of the incumbent. Uh, but what I was saying uh, is that mm. people should come in big numbers and stand. Even them. Those, do, those that qualify. They mm. also qualify, by the way. But taking into account their term of office, as we are explaining. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone with the closing remarks before we end this? Well, thank you very much. I think um, I'll close with the, with the governance uh, approach of it. Yeah. Uh, the Senate has been very central into, in ensuring that uh, the governance principles that this country has set forth that have been a foundation of national development are fully complied to. And uh, this current Senate and the forthcoming Senate will remain very crucial. That's why the election actually requires uh, people who uh, protect these particular principles. Dr. Yusta Kaitesi, acting CEO of Rwanda Governance uh, Board. Of course, Gatete uh, Nilingabu is a blogger, uh, constitutional lawyer, an activist, an analyst. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, Dr. Uh, rather, Mr. Charles uh, Mnyaneza.
uh, Executive Secretary of the National Electoral Commission, joining us here on the In Focus to talk about the upcoming senatorial election. Thank you so much uh, for whoever, wherever you're tuning in to watch us here on Rwanda Television. Of course, it doesn't end here. Should you have any questions, you know, remember the hashtag is In Focus RW, or you can tag in the National Electoral Commission for all the questions and comments you need to ask. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a good night. It's me, Ethan Tashovia. Bye-bye.